evening. What an honor it is for me. I, uh, I'm preaching a lot of places, but it's an honor to be back home and to preach uh, for a group this size, this many churches. Usually only one church will have me at a time. It is so good to be with you. I, I've, uh, I honestly consider this great privilege. I know who you had last year. Uh, Dr. Bob Tuttle is one of my dear, dear friends, and uh, I, I'm, I'm honored to be here. I, uh, I want to ask you to turn in your scripture with me, please, tonight, the 28th chapter of Matthew. While you're doing that, let me say that Dr. John Shellac was my mother's first cousin. And um, we would go deer hunting together. He, he was chief of surgery at Crawford Long Hospital. He would operate all night long sometimes, and then we'd pick him up and go deer hunting. He never climbed a tree. I learned why. I went to find him one day. He didn't come back to the, tr- back to the truck where we were, and uh, he was sound asleep on the ground. I don't think Dr. John ever shot a deer in his life, but he would go every time, and he would always find him sleeping. What a great man. And your Bibles, if you'll turn to the 28th chapter of Matthew, please, the 18th ch- verse, Matthew 28, 18. If you're able, I'd like you to stand with me, please, as we read the Word of God. The New Living Translation says this, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when he saw them, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Then Jesus told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Would you be seated for prayer, please? Lord God, we thank you that uh, you've brought all of us here at this place at this time Lord, uh, I've given up believing in accidents. I believe you've got all of us here for this place at this time for a purpose. Lord, I thank you for every one of these churches, every one of these pastors, all of these lay people. Lord, we're here to hear a word from you. Lord, if there's anything that I say that's not of you, it'll go over our heads. If it is of you, it'll go deep into our hearts. Lord, my prayer tonight is that when we leave this place, we will be more committed to do what you've called us to do than ever before. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My mother was a kindergarten teacher all of her life. My wife was a kindergarten teacher. I have two daughter-in-laws. They're both teachers. I know all there is to know about teaching elementary. It's tough to be married tough to be married to an elementary school teacher. They take you by the arm and they take you around the house and they say, you need to do this, you need to do this. I said, you don't have to hold my hand. But show and tell was always my favorite discussion around the dinner table. I'd say, well, what did you do today? Well, we had show and tell. Well, tell me about show and tell. And I would get these wonderful stories about show and tell. I heard a story about show and tell, a teacher, most likely in a private school today, but a teacher came and uh, told her students, she said, we're going to have a show and tell tomorrow, and I want it to be different. Many of you go to church, I know, and and so I want you to come and tell us about your church, and this is what I want you to tell us. I want you to tell us what church you go to and bring something to show us that represents your church. The first little boy that stood up was Benjamin the next day. Benjamin said, I'm Jewish. This is a star of David. The teacher said, thank you. Mary stood up and she said, I'm Catholic, and this is a rosary. Tommy stood up and said, I'm a Methodist, and this is a casserole dish. I am a United Methodist. 
I am glad I'm a United Methodist. But who are we? Who are we and what are we supposed to be doing? Sometimes I, I'm not sure we've ever asked that question. At least when I look at some churches, I preach in United Methodist churches all across the nation, and I'm not sure they know who they are, and I'm not sure they know what they're supposed to be doing. It's almost like we just come together and we meet and we go home without really realizing who we are and what we're supposed to be doing. I, um, I really want us tonight just in these few moments, to zero in on a couple of things. Who are we and what should we be doing? Or what is our mission as a church? The discipline of the United Methodist Church in the preamble of the Constitution says this, the church is the community of all true believers under the lordship of Christ. It is the redeemed and the redeeming fellowship. The redeemed and the redeeming fellowship. In another section of the, called the ministry and mission of the church, it says this, the mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. The discipline says that we are the redeemed people of God. We are the redeemed. You know what redeemed means? That means God has changed us through Jesus Christ. We're saved. We are bound for heaven. We are the redeemed people of God. And when we say to somebody that we are the redeemed people of God, it sounds very exclusive. And it is. It is. The church is made up of believers. We are the redeemed people of God. But then it's also inclusive because anyone is invited. Anyone is eligible. It's inclusive and it's exclusive. We are the redeemed people of God. And then it goes on to say, then we are the redeeming people of God. We're the redeeming people of God. Our mission, dear friends, is to be the redeeming people of God. John Wesley told his preachers at conference, you have nothing to do but save souls. I wonder if Wesley would recognize the church today. We do this, we do this, we do this, we do this. But does everything come back to saving souls? That's what it's talking about. I know that's archaic language today. Please forgive me. But God has called us to reach the lost for him, period. Our mission is to be the redeeming people of God. We're to go to the world, compel them to come to Christ. We're living in a world that's full of darkness, we're living in a world that's full of fear. I don't know if I've ever seen in my lifetime more people more scared about living. Wherever I go, I pray with people, no matter what age, young people, elderly people. I pray with people every week who are just shaking. They're so scared about the future. We're living in fear. We're living in darkness. Two years ago, I had the great privilege of going on a mission trip to Ghana in West Africa. It had been a while since I'd been on a mission trip. I, I was doing evangelism for 18 years in the United States, and I've always said that my mission field is the United Methodist Church in the United States, maybe the hardest mission field in the whole world. Uh, but a friend of mine, Dr. Jim Lowry, who I grew up with, district superintendent over the Atlanta Marietta District, was getting together a mission trip to go to Ghana, West Africa, and he said, Tom, I want you to go with me. I want you to represent evangelist." He so said, we've got three, uh, two pastors, I'm a district superintendent, and you'll be the evangelist. And then we've got, we've got uh, two doctors, we've got five nurses, and one dentist. And we're going to go so far back into the bush that many of these people, especially the children, have never seen a white person before. It's going to be tough. We're not taking anybody that hasn't ever been on a mission trip before. We may be sleeping on the ground. We don't know what's going to take place. It's going to be tough. And it was. One day, we set up our clinic, the last day, actually, of the trip. Uh, we, we drove two hours from the capital city, uh, two, excuse me, two days from the capital city to get where we were going. And then from there, we, we went out in every direction, four different days, for an hour and a half, as far as we could go. There was no communication. We didn't put up flyers. We didn't say the clinic's going to be here. But the last day, 600 people showed up. Can you imagine being in a, a doctor's waiting room with 600 people? That's what we want. That's what it was about. 
since I didn't know anything about doctoring or nursing or dentistry, I, uh, my job was crowd control. 600 people passed out tickets. One day, Jim came to me and he said, Tom, I, or, and during that day, he said, Tom, I, I found this little, little girl and she was, I don't know, seven or eight years old, a Ghanaian girl. He said, she won't open her eyes and she's crying. She won't stop crying. She just runs into people, bounces off of people, and just cries. And he said, I, I can't find her mother or father or anybody around. I don't know what's going on. And I, he said, what should we do, you think? I said, well, let's go find Jonathan. Jonathan was our missionary. He's a member of the, uh, the Alabama, North Alabama Annual Conference. Great, great man of God. Just, just loves the people, loves Jesus. He said, we need to find out if we can. We found Jonathan. He said, you need to find, you need to find her mother. I said, Jonathan, there are 600 people here. How are we going to find her mother? He said, just find her. Well, we found her first miracle that took place. We, can, we put the two together, and they were both crying, but the little girl still would not open her eyes. So we got together on the side, and John was there. I noticed that she had juju around her wrist. It's, it's braided things. It's, it's the voodoo of, of West Africa. And there were braided hair around her wrist and around her neck and down her back and around her waist. And Jonathan said, Tom, you have a knife? I said, yes. He said, cut it off of her. So we cut it all off of her. We anointed her with oil, and, and Jonathan started to pray. And as he prayed, he, he was building up. And, and all of a sudden, it's the first time, I think, in the prayer that he had said this. He said, and in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and when he said that, her eyes popped open. And she started to laugh and giggle. Her mother was screaming. Everybody was jumping up and down. We didn't know what was going on. And Jonathan finally had this conversation with her through an interpreter. And we asked, what was wrong? And she said, I don't know. She said, I was so scared. She said, it was so dark. I couldn't see. And I was so scared until you said that name. And and he said, what name? He said, that name. He said, what name? He said, that Je Jesus, that name. And when you said that name, I saw the light. My eyes were open and I saw the light. And I wasn't afraid anymore. Dear friends, there are people all around us, around your church, maybe even in your church that are scared, that are living in fear. And we've got the light. We've got the one, and we're responsible to take the light. And the question is, how are we doing? How are we doing? You see, I, I believe the Great Commission has become, in so many places, the Great Omission. I, I think we're not doing so good. Not only our United Methodist Church, but all the churches. We're just, last year... Less than 10% of the churches in the United States reported one conversion to Christ. Less than 10%. No county in the entire United States has more believers this year than they did last year. We in the United Methodist Church, we've been in decline for now 44 years. We've lost way more than 3 million members. 43% of our churches have not taken in one member on profession of faith. But we in North Georgia, we do better, don't we? We're the best. We are. We've led the denomination for 25 years in church growth. Praise God. But 30% of our churches didn't take in one member on profession of faith, not even a confirmation kid. Folks, we're, we're not doing it. Not like we ought to be. It wasn't always that way. In the 50s, we were taking in 400,000 people on profession of faith. In the last 40 years, that number has been reduced by 50%. Does that mean that nobody out there is lost? <laughs> no. We're just not doing the Great Commission like we should be. And so we ask the question, so what? So what? Does it really matter? Does it? It's just a numbers game. 
How many times have I heard that? Numbers aren't important, people are. It is important. It's important if you believe Scripture. And folks, I, I think that's the key. You must determine in your own heart, if you believe what the Word of God says, I choose to believe it. A couple of years ago, I was doing a workshop for a district, several workshops actually, on personal evangelism, how to do personal evangelism. Well, I thought, I don't know these people. I don't know if they really want to do personal evangelism or not. And I'm supposed to teach them how to do it. And so I came up with this ingenious idea of getting a three-by-five card and asking them some questions. I said, don't put your name on there, just, just real simple questions, yes or no. And then I'll be able to look at them, and I had about four workshops I was to do. And so I thought, this will help me, at least with my other workshops, to know these people. And one of the questions I thought was really simple, and I'm just kind of simple-minded anyway, but the question is, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven? Yes or no? I think that's a pretty simple question. And out of one workshop with, and I forgot to tell you, the only people that were invited to these workshops were pastors and lay leaders of the church. That was it. And out of 30 people, I had four people that said no. Listen, friends, you can't do evangelism. You can't do what the discipline and Scripture says unless we believe that Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. I think that's simple. I think it's there. you got to believe it. Now, if you believe it, then here's the bottom line. Randy Newman, the author of the wonderful book entitled Heaven, you need to go buy it, says this, as human beings, we have a terminal disease called mortality. The current death rate is 100%. Unless Christ returns soon, we're all going to die. We don't like to think about death, yet worldwide, three people die every second, 180 every minute, and nearly 11,000 every hour. If the Bible is right about what happens to us after death, it means that more than 250,000 people every day either go to heaven or hell. Sounds like to me, friends, we got a job to do. We as United Methodists have a job to do. And if it doesn't bother you, then God needs to break our hearts for the lost. They can be our family, they can be our friends or co-workers, maybe church members. George Barner says that 51% of folks in our churches are not going to heaven. I can share the statistics with you later on that. I've read the questions. I think he's pretty conservative on it. And we can't wait. We can't wait. I'm at the age right now, I'm tired of playing church. I got loved ones that I want to see in heaven. I, know, I, I can't work fast enough. God's called us to win the lost. I, um, a couple of years ago, I uh, was asked to help out for about six months at a pretty good-sized United Methodist Church in our conference. And so I did. I was teaching evangelism and doing evangelism. And one of the, uh, I went up to the pastor, senior pastor one day, and I said, you know, once a month we take communion. And, and, and I believe, uh, I believe what James 5 says, that if somebody's sick, they ought to call the elders of the church together and anoint the sick person with oil. I know that's foreign to some of you, but it's scriptural. It's not weird. We have 17 pages in our United Methodist Book of Worship on healing services. And I say, would you mind, or just think about this. He said, while you take communion, could I, could I stand right there in the middle and just announce that if anybody wants to be anointed and just let me pray for their healing, physical, spiritual, emotional, relational healing, and then I'll be glad to do that very quietly and there won't be any weird things going on. And he said, that would be good. That would be great. I think it shocked him because the line went out the door. But a lady came up to me, and I didn't know these people very well, and she came up to me and she said, Tom, would you pray for my husband? 
I said, sure. I said, is he sick? She said, no, he died last year. Ooh. Folks, time is short. God has called us to win the lost, period. Now, I wish I had two more hours. I'm in churches, different churches. I see the church different than any pastor in this conference. Because I'm in a different church every week or so. And I see some things that work and I see some things that don't work. They've even asked me now to help out with a little church that's a long story. But I'm able to put it into practice now and see what's working, what's not working. And this I've got to tell you. It's time for us to start looking outside the box, doing things differently. Insanity, the definition, you've heard this, keep doing the same thing the same way and expecting different results. We've been trying now for 40-something years to try to do something different, and we do the same thing. One of the great things I see about your connection group is things that are happening around here. I appreciate that more than you know. I, dro I drove by Lanier United Methodist Church. Anybody here from Lanier? Praise God. You're getting ready to start a new service. I almost want to come Sunday to find out what it's going to be like. Something new. I like new things. We've got to do things differently. The great theologian Siren Kierkegaard tells a wonderful, wonderful story, a parable that he made up. I have a feeling that as it's gone through the years, preachers have embellished it. Probably not this preacher, but other preachers have. So I'll tell you my story as, as he tells it. Kierkegaard said that one day there was a goose flying over the barnyard. Uh, there were some hunters down below at the pond. The goose flew over. They started shooting. They hit him. They winged him, and he started going down. Woo! Boom. Land in the middle of the barnyard, face down. All the domesticated animals in the barnyard, they scattered in all directions. They took off. They didn't know what it hit. The old goose wasn't dead. He realized that. He finally got up and dusted himself off. He tried to fly, and he couldn't fly. His wing was hurt. All the domesticated animals, they gathered around him. They said, who are you? He said, I'm a goose. They said, where'd you come from? They said, up in the sky. They said, where's the sky? He said, you don't know where the sky is? They said, no, tell us about the sky. He said, it's up there. They looked up and said, oh, that blue stuff. That's the sky. Yeah, that's the sky. We've never looked up before. What are those white things? Those are clouds. Were you up there? He said, yeah, I'd fly through those clouds. They said, wow, tell us more. And every day they'd come to the old goose. Every day. Say, tell us about flying. This went on week after week. Finally, the old goose just got tired. He, he said, I, I can't keep doing this. We've got to compromise. And so they did. And the compromise was that they would meet just once a week. Sunday was the day they picked. Uh, about the 11 o'clock hour on Sunday, I think. They even built him a little platform to stand on. And every Sunday at 11 o'clock, the old goose would stand up on the platform and he would extol to all who would listen the virtues of the good old days when he used to fly. And even though his wing healed up, he never tried to fly again. Listen, church, listen to me carefully. The good old days of the church are gone, and they will never, never return. Now, don't get me wrong. The gospel will never change, but we better do some changing. There's a lost and dying world hurting, fearful, scared out there, and the good old days when people would just flock to the church because there wasn't anything else to do, didn't have any place to go, they came to the church. Nowadays, they've got everything to do and ways to get there. We need to make some changes. Some of us that are getting older don't like change. But I want to tell you the greatest sin of the church is selfishness. You hear me? The church is the only organization in the world that exists not for itself. We exist for the people out there. It's not what we want. It's what they need. And God has called us to go, not sit soaking sour. 
He's called us to go into the world and preach the gospel. Go, make disciples, get out of here. This is not the church. The church is out there where we go. God's called us to go. Well, I wish I had time to share with you some other things about that kind of thing. Let me, let me almost reverse myself here. We need to do some new things. One of the greatest things I think you can do is a connection. I think you're already doing it is sharing with each other, learning from each other. Listen, there are things that this church does well that you've never heard of. I'm picking that up all the time. That's good stuff. But let me reverse and say this. Some of the old stuff is coming back. Please don't dismiss it. Uh, one of the main things I do is preach, quote, revivals. Ooh. Ooh. I was preaching in Jonesboro, getting ready to preach in Jonesboro, United Methodist Church. Parks Davis was the pastor at the time. P Parks called me up, this friend of mine called, called me up, and he said, uh, we don't want to call it revival. That's too old-fashioned. That's fine, Parks. Let's don't call it that. He said, what do you think we ought to call it? I said, I think we ought to call it repent or go to hell meeting. <laughs> he did not tell me I was on a speakerphone with the evangelism committee. <laughs> I don't care what you call it. Give people opportunities. Some of the old stuff is coming back. It really is. I'm on the board of directors for the Wesley Foundation at the University of Georgia. That is one of the greatest organizations that's ever been in the world. Bob Beckwith is a member of this little church that I'm pastoring right now, trying to pastor right now, stay on the road and pastor it too. Um, just talked to Bob this afternoon. Uh, they have 700 kids he preaches to every Wednesday night. They've had over 200 kids to go into full-time Christian service in the last 15 years. Several years ago, Wesley called me up, and um, before Bob came, actually, it was a good many years ago now, and, and Tom Tanner was there. Tom said, Tom, I, I, I want you to come preach a revival at, at, at Wesley. I said, okay. I knew they wouldn't call it revival. That's the Wesley Foundation. It's cutting edge. We, we had one of their musicians come and lead in this little church, and it's too cutting edge for us. I mean, it's really cutting edge stuff. I... They don't start preaching except till 10 o'clock. I'm ready to go to bed. But my first night, I'm driving down there about 9 o'clock at night, honestly. And they've got this huge banner across the street. Revival. It's too old-fashioned for some of our old churches, but it's okay for Wesley. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I don't care what you call this stuff. Some of it's coming back. I was preaching camp meeting at Lawrenceville, camp meeting. Now, that's in the middle of Gwinnett County. Sawdust everywhere. And the first night I was there, I was listening to some people talking. They said, isn't this cool? This is retro. This is like going back in the old days. This is cool. Some of the stuff is coming back. Don't dismiss it. Keep open. Think outside the box. Talk to each other. Pray with each other. Let's get together. Let's do it. Let's do it. For some reason, God has left it up to us. I wish I knew why. We don't do such a good job. He's left it up to us. My mentor, Dr. Dennis Kenlaw, change my ministry when he told me these words one time. He said, Tom, everyone's salvation is in somebody else. You ought to write that one down. That's good enough. Everyone's salvation. I know there are, there are exceptions, but, but everyone's salvation is in somebody else. And folks, it's not easy. It's hard work. I mean, it's work. Reaching people for Christ is tough. It can be messy. It's not glorious. But we got to do it. And you can't give up. Please listen to me. Do not give up. 
Don't give up. I love Mr. Wesley. In my quiet time, I say that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a scholar of Wesley. I am not. But I love Wesley. I ran across, a couple of years ago, I ran across something he had written in his journal, in his diary. I, I think, and this is my just guessing here, I think Mr. Wesley was absent-minded later on in life, like some of us are, especially pastors. I, I think he, and I think he, he didn't write in his diary all the time. He would go a week or two before he would write. And then I think he forgot some things. But I want you to read. This is our father, our spiritual father. I want you to listen to this. Sunday morning, May the 5th. Look, listen to the dates. They're one right after the other. Sunday morning, May the 5th. Preached at St. Anne's. Was asked not to come back anymore. Sunday p.m., May the 5th. Preached at St. John's. Deacon said, get out and stay out. Sunday a.m., May the 12th, preached at St. Jude's. Can't go back there either. Sunday p.m., May the 12th, at St. George's, kicked out again. Sunday a.m., May the 19th, preached at St. Somebody Else's. I call one of the great Wesley libraries in the United States, and I said, I need to read you something. I must have copied this wrong. Wesley said, preached at St. Somebody Else's. They called me back two days later. They said, Reverend Atkins, that's exactly what it says. And the only thing I can think of, he forgot where he preached. But he knew it was St. Somebody. Preached at St. Somebody Else's. Deacons called a special meeting and said I couldn't return. Sunday p.m., May the 19th, preached on the street, kicked off the street. Sunday a.m., May the 26th, preached in a meadow, chased out of the meadow as a bull was turned loose during the service. Sunday a.m., June the 2nd, preached out on the edge of town, kicked off the highway. Sunday p.m., June the 2nd, afternoon service, preached in a pasture. 10,000 people came to hear me preach. John Wesley had every reason to give up. He was locked out of churches. He was stoned. He was ridiculed. He didn't give up. He knew the soul was precious. Folks, every soul is precious. And it's our job, it's our job to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We have to do it. I can't tell you how. But I'm just going to ask you tonight. It's the only reason I'm here tonight. Would you commit with me tonight, just for a year, to find some way to do it? Maybe different than anything's going on in your church right now. But would you find a new way to do it, a different way to do it? Maybe it's an old way you need to bring back. Maybe it's a new something that nobody else has ever thought of. But would you commit with me tonight? Would you just say, I'm going to reach out. I'm going to find somebody that doesn't know Jesus. Go make disciples. That's what he told us to do. Wesley said, you have nothing to do but save souls. Go make disciples. Let's pray. Lord God, I, I pray tonight that you would make us soul winners. We don't hear that term anymore. Maybe that's why we're not doing it. Lord, I thank you for this connection group. Thank you that folks will come out on a Thursday night. But Lord, I thank you even more than that from what I'm hearing, that we're learning from each other. We're doing things a little differently. Uh, when I say a little church doing backpack ministry or a bigger church doing something different, and we're connecting. We're doing what, what Wesley would like us to do. Father, I pray tonight for every person here that you would give us ideas, uh, even if they're crazy ideas. 
I, I have the boldness tonight to pray that every person here would reach one person for Christ this year. Just one. Just one, that's all. Would you, would you silently, you don't have to do this, but would you just say tonight, in your heart at least, I will do it. I'll get out of the box. If God's calling me to do something different, I'll do it. If God's calling me to share with my pastor or somebody a new idea, I'll do it. Lord, I stand against the spirit of fear, the spirit of pride. Lord, we want to reach out for Jesus. Bless these dear folks here. Let this connection group be a catalyst for this district and this conference. Lord, uh, we need revival. It'd be really cool for it to start right here, to start with this group of churches. And then I'll look back and say, I was there when they said they would do it. Now bless us as we go from this place, committed to do what you've called us to do to reach the lost. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.